Hare Krishna Mataji, please accept my humble obeisance, these all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Panchakalpa Tarubiastra Kapa Sindhu Bhavacha Patitana Bhavane Vaishna Vibhyo Namo Nama. Hare Krishna on the Sambo Vaishnavas. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Narayanam Namaskrita Naram Cheva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudiriye Nasta Prayeshu Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Yatama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki So today we'll be reading from Canto 4, Chapter 11. And text 33, I've been asked to uh, complete chapter 11, so we'll also discuss verses 34 and 35. The uh, title of this chapter is Swayam Bhavu Manu Advises Dhruva Maharaj. So again, text 33, chapter 11, canto 4. Helanam Girisha Bratu Dananda Syatwaya Kutam Yajagnivan Punyajanan Bratur Grenan Iti Amar Shitaha Helanam, distractful behavior Girisha of Lord Shiva Bratuhu, the brother Dhanandasya, to Kuvera Twaya, by you Kritam, was performed Yet, because, Jagnivan, you have killed Punyajanan, the Yakshas, Bratru, of your brother, Granam, killers, Iti, thus thinking, Amarshitaha, angry. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. My dear Dhruva, you thought that you that the yakshas killed your brother and therefore you killed great numbers of them but by this action you have agitated a mind of lord shiva's brother kuvera who is the treasure of the demigods please note that your actions have been very disrespectful to kuvera and lord shiva purport lord manu stated that dhruva maharaj has been offensive to lord shiva and his brother kuvera because the Yakshas belonged to the Kuvera's family. They were not ordinary persons. As such, they have been described as Punya Jnana, pious men. Somehow or, somehow or other, the mind of Kuvera has been agitated, and Dhruva Maharaj was advised to pacify him. I'll read text 34 and uh, 35, the English translation and purport. Text 34. For this reason, my son, you should immediately pacify Kuvera with gentle words and prayers. Thus, his wrath may not affect our family. Purport. In our common dealings, we should maintain friendship with everyone, and certainly with, exalted, with such exalted demigods as Kuvera. Our behavior should be such that no one should become angry and thereby commit a wrong to individuals, family, or society. Text 35, the final verse of this chapter 11. Thus, Swayam Bhavu Manu, after giving instruction to Dhruva Maharaj, his grandson, received respectful obeisances from him. Thus, then Lord Manu and the great sages went back to their respective homes. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of so the fourth canto, 11th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Swayam Bhavu Manu advises Dhruva Maharaj to stop fighting. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam 
ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೂನ್ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೂನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗಜಾತ ಸಗನ ರಘುನಾಥ ವಿತ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವದೂತ ಪರಿರನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಗನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಾಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಂಗಿ ರಾಧೇ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವಿಶ್ವಭಾನು ಸುತೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಾಂಚಾಕಲ್ಪ ತ್ರೂಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧು ಪತಿ ಪಾವದೇವ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪೃಷ್ಠಾ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಿತಿ ನಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾರಿ ಪಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯದೇಶತಾರಿಣೆ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸರಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ದಾಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಬ್ಲೆಸಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಅಸೆಂಬಲ್ಡ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಸ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಮೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎ ಫ್ರೂಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ the ripened fruit of all vedic knowledge so we finish today chapter 11 of this great story of dhruva maharaj and the story continues in the next chapter chapter 12 of dhruva maharaj going back to godhead so as we know this story begins with dhruva maharaj avenging the uh denial of his ability to sit on the lap of his father by going to the forest and performing intense devotional service under the instructions and guidance of his guru narada muni and he so successfully performed his devotional service that he was granted the greatest of all benedictions which is the personal association with the supreme lord who bestowed all knowledge upon him by placing his conch on his head and thus enlightening him. And he was given what we all can aspire for and hope for, which is the guarantee to go back home, back to Godhead. That is the mission of the living entities in this material world is to awaken our relationship with Krishna and return back home, back to Godhead. And so Dhruva Maharaj was given this great benediction and guarantee, in addition to some other responsibilities to do in ruling the planet prior to his return home. And so in this chapter, we see now Dhruva Maharaj is receiving some instruction, some advice from Swayam Bhavama. And Dhruva Maharaj began to a process to avenge the death of his brother, Uttama. His dear brother had been killed in the forest by the Yakshas. And so he began fighting very, very ferociously. And the chapter begins with a description, vivid description of how Dhruva Maharaj was, was fighting. And Srila Prabhupada comments in the purport that this violence that Dhruva Maharaj was uh, conducting was sanctioned uh, as a Kshatriya, that uh, Dhruva Maharaj had a duty to perform, and that duty to perform is to protect society. And in the protection of society, there is a utilization or a principle by which violence may be used to protect against the six different types of aggressors. And so Dhruva Maharaj began to fight and he displayed some anger. We'll talk a little bit about anger today. 
Um, but that anger was getting to a point or reaching to a point that had the potential to exceed the guided principles of the use of even anger and violence. And so Swayam Babu Manu comes and begins to speak to Dhruva Maharaj to encourage him to stop. And he is telling him in the early part of this chapter that he has achieved something extraordinary. He has received the fortune of being able to go back home to Godhead, having had the direct personal darshan of the Supreme Lord. And so he should not risk this great fortune by falling down to the dangers of this unnecessary violence and unnecessary levels of anger. And he encouraged him that you should be an exemplary um, person representing the pure devotee. You should act in this very exemplary way because that is what is pleasing to your master, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. And so he began to instruct on that level. And then he came to the platform, this is again the Swayam Bhava Manu, of discussing that ultimately everything is beyond our control. Even the death of your brother, the forces of nature are carrying on all the affairs of the material world. And ultimately it is due to one's karma, past desires, past actions, and thus resultant reactions. One has to suffer. In Krishna, the Supreme Lord is controlling everything. And he gives the example of the bull who is controlled by the rope through its nose. Even Lord Brahma, what to speak of us, are all under the control of the Supreme Lord. And so, but though he is under, though Krishna is controlling everything, he is also aloof. He is the killer, but not the killer. As Swayam Babu Manu explained. And so, for these reasons, Dhruva Maharaj is being encouraged to stop this unnecessary violence. And he is encouraged to turn his attention back to the Supreme Lord and to surrender to him and to give up this illusory concept of I and my. And so, in the last couple verses that were being discussed, Swayam Babu Manu is, is warning him against the foremost enemy on this path of self-realization, and that is anger. This anger, as Srila Prabhupada comments in the purport to text 31, he says that his angry was sanctioned. He actually, Prabhupada says, Dhruva Maharaj was a liberated soul, and actually he was not angry with anyone. But because he was the ruler, it was his duty to become angry for some time in order to keep law and order in the state. And he gives the very uh, beautiful story of Narada Muni and the snake. And we'll discuss a little bit about this application of anger. So now in text 33, Dhruva Maharaj is being advised to you know, take care or to repent for his actions. And ultimately, Swayam Bhava Manu will leave and it is up to Dhruva Maharaj to decide now how to act. And we see, we'll discuss a little bit about how Dhruva Maharaj responded to his actions. So that is a little bit of a summary of a very wonderful chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. So today, uh, I thought, with your permission, we can discuss a little bit about anger, as that leads into the specific verses today. Um, and then we'll talk about this topic of making mistakes. You know, we say to err is human. And how we can look at mistakes from the different angles, from the performer of the mistake, to the recipient of one's mistaken actions, to one who may be in a position to correct mistakes. And how if we take a very uh, 
devotional approach following Vaishnava etiquette to either making mistakes, to either being the recipient of a mistake, or to be in a position to correct someone's mistake by following the Vaishnava etiquette, we can achieve great outcomes. Because making mistakes is inevitable, again, to err as human. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll speak about our interactions with the other living entities around us. The verse in, in, in 34 speaks about how you know, we should maintain friendship with everyone, Shiva Prabhupada comments. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then in the last verse, we'll see how Dhruva Maharaj respond, I should say responded, to Swayam Bhava Manu and his instructions. So that is what we'll uh, discuss today. So as we've been discussing, again, anger and violence has its place. But it is also, we know, uncontrolled anger is the, leads to our downfall and destruction. So the nature of anger, where it comes from, we've been discussing, that it manifests from lust. When the sense objects lead to attachments, this material attachments leads to intense lust. And when lust goes unsatisfied, when what we want, we so desperately desire and hanker for in the material world, when it goes unsatisfied, it turns into wrath or anger. And as explained in the Bhagavad Gita, this anger leads ultimately to our downfall. We become delusional, illusioned, loss of intelligence, and ultimately we fall down. So the, the root cause of one's anger is their lust, their material attachments. So we see so many books on anger management. If you type in anger management in Amazon, you'll see a list of over 5,000 books on anger management. There are so many classes on anger management. But Srila Prabhupada is giving us the instruction on lust management. Because without controlling our lust, our material attachments, we can only temporarily control our anger before it manifests again. And we know how many good decisions have we made when we've been angry. And we certainly can count how many bad decisions we've made, regrettable things we have spoken, regrettable things we have done. And so this anger is very, very dangerous for us in our devotional process. In the um, Bhagavad Gita, we see that the three gateways to hell are described in the 16th chapter. And the three gateways to hell are lust, anger, and greed. Because when this lust goes unsatisfied, it leads to this anger. When it gets satisfied, it leads to greed. Meaning I want more and more. And ultimately that want for more will also go unsatisfied. And it will end in anger. So the it is the direct link. There is no other option. And we see the examples in, in our scriptures around the dangers of it. You know, Hiranyakashipu. He had full control. He had the whole universe under his control. Everyone was fearful of his reign and succumbing to his every desire. Even the rivers when they were flowing, they were so fearful. They were producing jewels unlimitedly. The fields would produce crop even without seeds being planted for fear of Hiranyakashipu's wrath. So he had everything, but he did not have the control and mind share of one young boy, Prahlad Maharaj. And for that, his lust was not satisfied and it led to anger and he began to exact punishment on Prahlad Maharaj and ultimately, as we know, led to his downfall. 
And we see this in the pastimes of Ravan and repeatedly throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. So this anger has a very, very uh, dangerous um, situation for us. But it also has a positive application that Srila Prabhupada is kind, uh, pointing us to. In the Nectar of Instruction, Srila Rupa Goswami presents the first verse, this Vajra Vegam, Manasakroda Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udara Pashto Vegam. There are these six Vegams, urges, that we have. The urges to speak, the urges of the mind, the urges of anger. And in the discussion of anger, in the discussion of each of these six urges, there are positive engagements of these urges and there are negative engagements. Positive, negative is defined by what is good for us in our spiritual life. So, there is a positive application of anger. And we see that to protect Krishna, to protect his devotees, to protect the reputation of, of bhakti, anger is sometimes needed to be employed. And Srila Prabhupada thus commented on the pastime of Narada Muni with the snake. And he had to use his hood to, to shoo away the children who were tormenting him. Jaitanya Mahaprabhu, who came as a flood of mercy, of love and compassion. He brought no weapons with him, but the holy names. He was using just the weapons of the holy names to pierce through the hearts of all the sinful enemies of the world. Yet, when his dear Lord Nityananda was attacked by Jagai and Madai, he immediately called for his Sudarshana Chakra. And Madai was to be destroyed. Jagai was saved because he actually had held back further attack. And thus Chaitanya Mahaprabhu looked very compassionately on him. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was ready to destroy Madai had it not been for the mercy of Lord Nityananda. We see anger in Lord Nashingadev in the past time we just discussed. So intense was his anger that even Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva would not approach him in attempts to pacify him, to cool him down. They were very fearful of this intense anger. And what fueled his anger was this atrocities against his devotees. Krishna does not get angry. When someone attacks him, it is pleasurable. It is joy. It is an insignificant event. But when someone attacks his devotees, he loses all tolerance. So this anger has its place. Even in the spiritual world, in the realms of pure devotional service, there is anger. In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we see this one rasa of mana. This seemingly angry. And if you've been to Rindavan, you may have gone to the beautiful place of Manasarovar. Very beautiful, beautiful place. And it is a pastime place of Srimati Radharani and Lord Krishna. And there, Srimati Radharani displays anger to Krishna. But it is seemingly anger. That is how Srila Prabhupada presents it. Meaning, this anger is not due to uncontrolled material attachments. But it is anger displayed by Srimati Radharani for the pleasure of Krishna. Krishna enjoys experiencing this rasa as well. Right? We know in the pastime of, of Mahabharata, Bhishma Dev wanted to see, to have darshan of Krishna in an angry mood. And thus he deployed a strategy to have such a darshan. So like this, there is the appropriate use of anger also. But we should be very, very careful in, in managing and getting control of our anger. Because it is, again, the gateway to hell and it can destroy our devotional service. And Vaishnavas, great, great personalities, have the ability to remain very calm and cool through very 
disturbing circumstances and unsettling situations. You know, uh, once there was the assembly of all the great sages and they were trying to determine who was most supreme. And there was a debate between the supremacy of Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and Lord Vishnu. And so they asked Brigha Muni to conduct a test, a proof positive test to figure out ultimately conclusively who was supreme. And what test he determined, he said, whoever could be most tolerant to an unsettling circumstance, one who could control their anger, they would be most supreme. And so he approached Lord Brahma with this quest. And he, when he approached Lord Brahma, he did not offer proper respects and ignored the presence in some way. And thus Lord Brahma became angry, but then was pacified. Uh, he was ready to destroy, but then again was pacified. So he understood, Brigha Muni understood, no, and he carried on to Lord Shiva. And we went to Lord Shiva, he was about to be embraced by Lord Shiva and he spoke unkind words, saying, no, 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 stay away, you are covered in ash, you are, no, 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 I don't want to touch. And he spoke unkind words to Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva was ready to destroy Brigha Muni, but he was held back by Parvati Devi. And so then Brigha Muni goes to Lord Vishnu. And there he sees Lord Vishnu. And he goes and he kicks Lord Vishnu on the chest with his foot. And after kicking, Lord Vishnu immediately responds. He gets up. Oh, Brigha Muni, I'm sorry. I hope your foot is not hurt. It is come in contact with my very hard chest. And he goes to massage the foot and heal the foot of Brigha Muni. We can see that in the provocation of behavior, Lord Brahma was disturbed. In the provocation of unkind words, Lord Shiva was disturbed. But in the most provoking of activities, which is the physical contact, Lord Vishnu responded with great compassion. And so this was the test that Brigha Muni put, and he determined the supremacy. Of course, our Shastra unequivocally determined who is most supreme, but it is instructive for us to see that the more we can control this anger, the further we are in our devotional life. Haridas Thakur was a great example. He was being beaten and beaten and beaten in the marketplace. Yet, he was praying for those who were beating him to be delivered. So much was his compassion that he knew that if he did not die, that those who were beating him would be killed by the very envious Nawab. And thus he faked his own death so that those who were beating him could fulfill their duty, even though their duty was to beat him mercilessly in 22 different marketplaces. You can see how Haridas Thakur refrained from the disturbance, refrained from becoming angry. And that is due to his purity and bhakti. So many examples. Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasa Muni Dravasa Muni invoked a fiery demon. And Ambarish Maharaj responded with calm, patience, folded hands. Even while that chakra was chasing Dravasa Muni for one full year, Ambarish Maharaj remained patiently waiting for the return of Dravasa Muni so that he could fulfill his duty of honoring the process of giving him prasadam. So you can see the great personalities, they use anger and they control their anger in extraordinary ways.
which is very, very instructive for us. So now we'll talk a little bit about making mistakes. We see in some way, at least from an instructive perspective, that, that a mistake was made or about to be made by Dhruva Maharaj. Yeah. Now, we can understand a devotee who has been given the guarantee of going back to Godhead by Krishna himself, who was personally instructed by the great Narada Muni, has made a mistake. So then what is the chances of us making a mistake? We see great, great personalities like Lord Indra, you know, Govardhan Lila, you know, makes a mistake. Lord Brahma by stealing their cowherd boys and calves. So if these great, great personalities can make a mistake, what about us? So we should understand, they're going to happen. We are going to make mistakes in the process of devotional life. To err is human, and we are human. We are fallible. So the main question then for us is, how are we going to respond to such mistakes? It is not a question of if. It is only a question of how we are going to respond. Swayam Bhava Manu is correcting Dhruva Maharaj. This is the role as his senior guiding, loving associate. And that is the role of the senior devotees, to correct the junior devotees. But we often, you know, in our process of bhakti, we're going to forget certain principles or let our emotions get in the way of logic. So that when the mistakes happen, we should understand it is natural. But we sh can approach these mistakes with a very nice attitude that can lead to a positive outcome from whatever mistake we have made. If we approach these mistakes with humility, with a sense of ownership, and a desire to learn from it, then it can be a, even a positive experience. You know, Dhruva Maharaj, speaking of humility, he could have said to Swayam Bhavamana, Hey, I've got my guarantee. The word of the Lord is fixed. So whatever you are speaking to me, yeah, it's nice, but I'm guaranteed. But Dhruva Maharaj did not take such a stance, as we saw in the last verse. He offered obeisances to Swayam Bhavamana and was grateful for the instruction. So approaching these situations with humility is of utmost importance. Understanding no matter how far we may have come in devotional service, or how far we have to still go, we should approach it with great humility. You know, when we make a mistake, our opportunity is to take ownership of it. You know, often due to our false ego, we want to deflect it, explain it away, come up with various reasons for why it may have happened. But you can see great devotees like Dhruva Maharaj, he did not, you know, put forth back his case about why he was, you know, avenging the death of his brother. He had some good Shastric principles to reflect on. But he listened very attentively and understood, and as we'll see in the next chapter, followed those instructions. So there was a sense of ownership. And finally, an opportunity to learn from it. If we make a mistake, the bigger mistake is to make it again. The original mistake, yeah, it's going to happen. But our opportunity is to learn from it, to see what did I do? and how I can avoid it from happening again. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that my devotee never perishes. Why he has to speak, my devotee never perishes? Because he knows, yes, we're going to make some mistakes. But he says, my devotee never perishes as long as and because they remain steady in their devotional service. By remaining in bhakti, one will purify from whatever impurities exist that led to that mistake. And we should have our Acharya's comment on that verse that we must have a lamenting mood 
a regretful mood for that mistake. We should not say, oh, Krishna said my devotee never perishes. Oh, no, not Krishna. Even Arjuna said it. He was told to declare it boldly. No, we should not be very loose with those mistakes that happen or just thinking, oh, yeah, they happen to err as human. No, there should be a, a regretful and lamenting approach and a determination to learn from it. So we see that mistakes are very possible, but our opportunity as the conductor of that mistake is to, again, approach it with humility, understand what it is that we did, take ownership of it, and try to learn from it. And what should our response be? Swayam Bhavamunu is telling that you offer prayers, you ask for forgiveness. And when we study Srimad Bhagavatam, we see this over and over again. You know, see the prayers of Lord Indra in Canto 10 after the devastating rainfalls in Vrindavan. How he offered very beautiful prayers to Lord Krishna to ask for forgiveness and to glorify the Lord. Lord Brahma did the same also in Canto 10 after stealing the cowherd boys and cows. So like this, we see this is the means for us to follow. This is the path to follow. So we offer prayers. We ask for forgiveness. And our biggest challenge in mistakes, if, if only one thing resonates with all of us today, I hope it is this that I heard recently that really struck with me. Our biggest challenge is that early on in our process of devotional service, early on when we first come to Krishna consciousness, it's very easy to see our mistakes. It's very easy to let others correct us. It's very easy for us to learn from our mistakes. But as we progress in devotional service, we shut our eyes and heart to that. Actually, as we progress, we should be more attentive to our mistakes and more eager to correct as we have acquired more and more fortune of having the opportunity to remain under the shelter of Srila Prabhupada in devotional service. We should cherish it more and be even more attuned to protecting it. But unfortunately, due to our false ego, as we progress, sometimes we become more defensive and less attuned to our potential mistakes. It blocks our vision. So we can hope that the mood we had when we first started in Krishna consciousness, this eagerness to learn, this humility to be correct, to be that, oh Prabhu Mataji, please tell me if I'm doing anything wrong. Please guide me. We would approach we don't even know how to offer water to Tulsi during Mangal Arti, something else simple. That mood we had, if we can remember every day as we progress back home, back to Godhead, then we'll be protected so that when those mistakes do happen, we can quickly overcome them. So let us hope that we can try to maintain that mood and increase it, this willingness and openness to own our mistakes. And the key is to be humble. Learn from it and to own it. The other side of making a mistake is the person who is on the receiving end of such mistake. So, as we know, to err is human in the association of devotees. Yeah, we may be on the receiving end. And we'll see how Kuvera responds in the next chapter. Very, very sweetly, he responds. So as a recipient of a mistake, we should be very tolerant, understanding no one is perfect. Yes, I am also committing mistakes. So maybe somebody has stolen my rascula from my plate. Okay, and no need to respond angrily. So we should be tolerant, have compassion, Understanding, yes, whatever has been done to me, 
It is out of conditioning. A devotee actually sees, yes, when I am the recipient of some uh, unsettling situation, it is only due to my own karma, my own prior misfortunes. Actually, the recipient of a mistake from someone else, they should be grateful. Oh, thank you for slapping me. You have now reduced my bad karma balance, and I am that much closer to emptying my account. So having a mood of humility, compassion, and tolerance on the receiving end of such a mistake is the real Vaishnava etiquette. And we'll see this by Kuvera, and we see this in many other pastimes and stories. If one is on the side of correcting a mistake, so we have, if you've made a mistake, if you've been on the receiving end of a mistake, and what if you are in a position to correct someone's mistake, what to do, how to approach? Correcting one's mistake is a very, very tricky situation. It's a very delicate matter. First, one should be in such a position as given by the authorities to take corrective action. Again, we are not the eyes and ears for Krishna. He has plenty of those. But if we are in a position granted and given, assigned by our superiors to help manage certain affairs or certain things, then there may be a time where we must correct someone's actions. That correction should be done with extraordinary compassion. You know, the goal should be to help that person. Not to criticize that person to help my own pride and feeling of self-worth or satisfaction. But the goal should be at a deep compassion, lamenting the need to correct, but doing it as a means and a desire to help that person progress in bhakti. That must be our mood. Otherwise, we should stay away from such activity. You know, there should be great empathy. Swayambhava Manu, before correcting Dhuva Maharaj, he expresses, I understand you are pained by the loss of your brother. He showed empathy, understanding the situation that the person is in. So as a corrector, you know, one should understand you know, where that person is coming from. And as Swayam Bhava Manu is doing, he is quoting Shastra, principles, for the basis of correction. It should not just be our personal opinion, but on the basis of Shastra, on the basis of teachings from the prior Acharyas. Dear Prabhu, dear Mataji, dear Srila Prabhupada has guided us to do it this way, or whatever we may do, but use you know, the evidences we have, not our own opinions. And thus, if you are in the, I can say, unfortunate situation of needing to correct someone's mistake, then you can do so in a way that will yield a positive outcome by helping that person. So all three angles should be handled. Either the committer of the mistake, either the recipient of the mistake, or the one needing to correct. And thus, very nice outcomes can come from these types of situations that otherwise can be very tricky. So, the, in the core principles from all angles, all three angles, is this humility and tolerance. Right? Both the doer and the recipient. One of my favorite pastimes, I will share again, I know all of you have heard it, but hopefully it is enjoyable to hear over and over again. You know, in the pastime of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Mahaprakash Leela, we see there is a great exchange between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the associates of Navadvip, where he was granting Krishna Prema to everyone, whatever one's desire he was fulfilling. But the devotees were troubled in questioning the fact why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not giving this love to his beloved mother Sachimata. And so they approached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Let us call Sachimata. 
And he said, no, she is an offender. And their hearts were broken, torn to pieces. How Sachimata could be an offender? Sometimes in our impure state, when we hear somebody else has made a mistake or an offense, we become gladdened, happy. And that is a very bad reaction for us. Directly, diametrically opposed to how a devotee feels. So the devotees were shattered. And so they inquired about the source of this mistake and they understood that many years ago, Sachimata, and of course this is not a mistake, this is simply an example for all of us to learn from how to approach when a mistake is made and also how to be on the receiving end of such a mistake. So Sachimata many years ago was lamenting for just a moment, lamenting only in her mind, not even verbally. Nobody else knew, but lamenting that her elder son, Misharup, had left and taken sannyas and he was studying under the great care and guidance of the great Advaita Acharya. And now her beloved Nimai was also studying under the guidance and shelter of Advaita Acharya. And she became fearful that he may also develop a mood of renunciation. And Shashti thought, this Advaita who should be unifying families is actually Dvaita and separating us. Just a moment of thought. And for that moment of thought, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to teach us all an opportunity to learn about the offenses. So the devotees went to Sachimata and explained this and she was shocked and said, Oh, I have offended the great Advaita Acharya. And so she immediately goes with the associates to Advaita Acharya and tries to beg forgiveness by touching the feet of Advaita Acharya. Now Advaita Acharya's response is equally epic. He is completely distraught, thinking, No! How? Satyamata, you are the eternal mother of Krishna. I can never be offended by you. And he denied her from touching his feet. And actually he was in so much pain that he lost consciousness and he passed out. And then Sachimata goes and sees this as an opportunity to obtain forgiveness for her mistake. And she touches the feet, pulls the dust off of the feet of Advaita Acharya onto her head. And thus, she repented for her so-called mistake. In this exchange, you see, Sachimata had great humility. She did not say, oh, I was just joking. Come on. Or, I didn't say that. I didn't even mean that. No. She took an extraordinarily humble approach, an extraordinarily determined approach. And Advaita Acharya on the receiving end did not think, oh yes, I have been offended. Yes, you may be forgiven. No, he so quickly wanted to escape such a situation. He would not even accept that an offense had occurred. So there you see great Vaishnava etiquette. Humility on both sides. When we see conflict in society, Conflict even within our devotional society. If both parties take a very humble and tolerant approach, then any situation can be diffused very, very quickly and very, very easily. And Srila Prabhupada told us all that you will show me your love for me by how well we all cooperate and work together. Yes, in the association devotees, mistakes are going to happen. But by cooperation and taking a very humble approach, we can overcome them. And we see this in this nice pastime.
So devotee, Vaishnava etiquette is to tolerate and to be humble in all circumstances. This is a sign of pure devotional service and our progress in bhakti. Kuvera could have responded with anger, but we'll see how he responds. Even denying, oh, nothing has been done. So, hopefully we all can also learn some process, whether we are on the mistake side, whether we are on the receiving side, or if we are in a position to correct. Swayam Babu Manu is worried about his family's harm that may come by Dhruva Maharaj's behavior. We also should be very attentive to how our behavior may bring harm to Srila Prabhupada's family, his family of his son. You know, our behavior should be always exemplary and extraordinary. And that brings us to the next verse in which Prabhupada is guiding us that we should act in a way not to create a disturbance to anyone. Dhruva Maharaj's actions have disturbed the mind of a great soul. But the concept here of not disturbing is applied very liberally, broadly. Not to anyone should we not disturb. Not just our senior devotees, not just our friends. To all living entities. In the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we see the chapter 14 around ideal householder life. How broadly this should be described? Verse 9 of chapter 14 reads, quote, One should treat animals such as deers, camels, asses, monkeys, mice, snakes, birds, and flies exactly like one's own son. How little difference there actually is between children and these innocent animals. End quote. The only difference between all of them is just a degree of their misuse of their independence. Otherwise, all part and parcel of Krishna. So we see that this not giving harm to anyone is very broadly applied, not just to the great souls, even to the deers, camels, asses, monkeys, mice, snakes, birds, and flies. You know, Mugrari the hunter, after being delivered by Narada Muni, when the ants were crossing in the way, he would not give disturbance to. One very sweet pastime, Srila Prabhupada was once in, um, on a, in the field somewhere honoring Prasad, and there was a bowl of fruit, and some ants had come, and one of his servants went to shoo away the ants to get, take them off the fruits. And Prabhupada said, no problem. How much they'll eat anyways. Let them enjoy. And then I'll eat. Like this, you can see Srila Prabhupada's mood of compassion and love for all entities. So we should be very thoughtful of how our actions may affect others. You know? And the most hurtful weapon we have is not our fist or our legs, or our arms. Yes, by a punch or a kick, it may hurt for an hour or two. But the hurt that can be caused by our tongue, by our sharp words, it can hurt for days or even decades. This vacho vegum. We should be very careful how we use our words not to give disturbance to anyone. Sure, physically, we should be very loving to all the living entities around us. But also with our words, we can be very careful not to upset the mind or heart of anyone. Unfortunately, those we are closest to, those we may love the most, we let our sometimes uncontrolled anger or false ego allow our tongue to deliver great pain to others. So by being attentive to this process, we can try to control such things. And finally, we see 
in this final verse how Dhruva Maharaj received the corrective activity. Again, he could have said, I'm good, thank you very much, but I've got my guarantee. Here's my ticket, booked and confirmed. But he did not. He took a very humble approach. How do we know? He says, Thus Swayam Babu Manu, after giving instructions to Dhruva Maharaj, his grandson received respectful obeisances from him. Dhruva Maharaj offered his pranams to Swayambhu, grateful for receiving this corrective advice. We often admonish those who correct us, but Dhruva Maharaj is guiding us. We should be so grateful for anyone who comes and gives us some corrective action corrective advice. Actually, there's the blessing of Krishna. The devotee sees that when someone corrects us, it is the blessing of Krishna to shine light on whatever we may need to correct. Because that without that seeing those mistakes, how we can make progress. So let us also try to follow in the footsteps of these great devotees and not let our false ego blind us to anything that we may do in the process of bhakti. So just to summarize, we talked about anger and it having its place, but also needing it to be checked. Its place is being used to protect the Supreme Lord and all of his associates, but not to be used to protect our own ego, fame, reputation, or pride. Its source comes from lust. And so to control anger, we must control our material attachments and lust. We are going to make mistakes. Own it. Learn from it. And let us be humble. Let us remember the days when we were so eager to find our mistakes and correct them when we first started. Let us try to make that sentiment alive in our hearts today and for the rest of our lives. If we receive a mistake, let us be compassionate, tolerant, loving. And if you are correcting, be, have the mood of only wanting to help, not hurt. And let us try to be loving to all living entities, seeing everyone as part and parcel of Krishna. And if someone does correct us, fall at their feet, thank them. Because without such corrective forces in our life, we will fall off the path back home, back to God. So, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jaya Nantakoti Vaishnavinda Ki Any comments or questions, clarifications or corrections? We can have some discussion. Thank you, Prabhuji. Very wonderful. Very nicely you have explained. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Dandra Pranams. Hare Krishna. Dandra Pranams. Please accept my humble obeisances. Prabhu, one question I have. Uh, we sometimes hear uh, the term transcendental anger in relation to pure devotees, not uh, other pure devotees like that, or Krishna, or like that. What does that mean? So, I know the general meaning of the word transcendental, but I don't know how it applies to this quality of transcendental anger. Yes, yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu, Dhanva Pranams. So transcendental anger, um, again, uh, this is discussed in the first verse of Nectar of Instruction, um, the positive engagement of anger. So anger uh, used to protect the, to, to protect Krishna and all of his devotees, the name, fame, and reputation, um, anger uh, used in such works is transcendental or we can say positive engagement. 
you know, some examples, you know, I, I gave like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in anger wanting to um, destroy Jagai and Madai because that was for the purpose of protecting Lord Nityananda. When he was insulted, when he was not respected, he tolerated. He never showed any anger. But when someone was hurting one of his devotees, that he could not tolerate. We see Srila Prabhupada in fighting for the society, particularly in the early days, sometimes he had to also use anger. You know, when the devotees were, some money was stolen from them in New York, he wrote a very harsh letter to the one very, you know, big lawyer in New York, demanding that money back. It was in a mood of anger, but for the purpose of protecting Krishna's assets and to protect his disciples from being cheated. In fighting for the land at Juhu, Srila Prabhupada fought ferociously. He had made a promise to Shishi Radha Rasa Bihari that he, the temple would be built. And so to protect that, he fought very ferociously. So that is a, just some examples of transcendental anger. So the distinction is, am I fighting for myself? For my own self-preservation? For my own ego and pride? Or am I fighting to protect Krishna and his loving associates? So that's what distinguishes between transcendental anger and material anger. Now there is a, another higher realm of transcendental anger, which is this rasa that Krishna also enjoys. He enjoys the rasa of sweetness, of humor, of you know these different relationships. He also enjoys this you know kind of you know this mood of anger, um, and so uh, Shrimati Radharani plays that role. That is that mana rasa, that mana bhav, that is seemingly angry. It's not real anger, but to give Krishna the pleasure, sometimes even Srimati Radharani will show anger to Krishna. But it is not real anger. It is only for the pleasure of Krishna. So that is the, the concept of transcendental anger. Hare Krishna, thank you for your question, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, can you can you tell us like the you say the source of anger is lust, but can you give some more uh, you know like kind of uh, example of because anger is kind of very situational, like you know. So how how to kind of you know control that that point in time. Yeah, yeah. So the in in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks um, verses sixty two and sixty three about the the source of our anger. Right? So he says, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops, and from lust, anger arises. Right. So, the, the, the lust is this intense, intense hankering for different things. I want this. I want this promotion in the job. And I want it so badly because it will allow me to then go on those wonderful vacations and buy that BMW I want and enjoy the pleasures of a larger house because more money will come. So I want it so badly. But when it doesn't come, then I become angry. I become very frustrated. And the challenge is this, that all of our material desires, no matter how much we try to fulfill them, they are never satisfied. Lust is never satiated. 
any material desire we have, it's never satisfied. And so it always results in anger. There's no other way around it. So when we, ha when we become angry, at least after the fact, sometimes in the midst of anger, it's hard to be introspective. But after the fact, we can kind of dissect and think, why I became so angry? And you will trace it back to this attachment. You know, we become frustrated. We want to control things, but that we are not to control it. Krishna is the supreme controller. When things we want to happen, don't happen, we become angry. And why we want them to happen is because of some material desire. So if we, you'll be able to identify if, with, and if, you know, if you need some help, you can speak with someone who can guide you. Prabhuji Mataji, I was angry about this. What did I do? Why did it come? You'll, it'll trace back to lust. It is the root cause of all of our anger. And so by the process of devotional service, actually devotees say that it is one of the most apparent and quickest changes we experience when we begin our Krishna consciousness. Wow, I used to get so angry and now I'm not. It's not just the rasgulas that are not making us angry. It is the purification of our material attachments, the lessening of our lust. That is what is lessening our anger. And so you can kind of see it that way. Did that answer your question, Prabhu? I... Uh, yeah, Prabhu, like, uh, and also, uh, are there any food habits which is connecting to this, uh, you know, this, this kind of things uh, where we need to control the kind of foods? I'm sorry. Can you can you can you repeat the question again? Was, I, I didn't hear it clearly. Is, is, is there any food habits which is connecting to this Prabhu, like that will help uh, in some situation of uh, reducing the anger did, or whatever? You, know? you said food habits or good habits? Yeah, food habits. Yeah. What what food to eat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Connected to food. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So th that is a very straightforward answer. Just eat prasad. Just eat prasad. Just eat prasad. All other food steps we are verily eating, only sin. So no need for strict dietary restrictions. I should avoid this, that, and the other. The only restriction is very generous. Just eat prasad. Which Eating anything that is not offered through the Supreme Personality of Godhead carries so much danger for us. Even foods in the mode of goodness, if they are not offered to Krishna, carry some sinful reactions for us. Eating foodstuffs that are cooked by non-devotees and not offered to the Lord that food we eat carries the consciousness of the cook. So if the cook is angry, that consciousness is carried through the foods into our consciousness by consumption. So the safest way is to only honor Krishna Prasadam. That should be our uh, goal for many reasons but that it certainly will um, protect us from having any foodstuffs that fuel our anger. Beyond that, yes, foods in the mode of passion, foods in the mode of ignorance, will increase our anger. So those are explained in the, towards the end of Bhagavad Gita. So very spicy foods, you know, uh, very pungent foods. Um, certainly flesh of the animal. So much anger goes into the killing of the animal that that consciousness carries through. So that is on the you know, next level. If we are not going to follow the, the, the etiquette of just honoring Prasad, at least at an absolute minimum, we should avoid all foods in the mode of passion and ignorance because that will increase our anger.
Most definitely. Hare Krishna, thank you for your question. Hare Krishna Prabhu Siddhandavat Pranam, all glories to Shri Prabhupada. Prabhuji, how to control negative thoughts? Like, uh, it's not you want to, you want to think about it, but it comes spontaneously, right Prabhuji? Just like mm. you said, like Shachi Mata, uh, her intention is not to offend, offend, um, Prabhuji, but uh, it's just a thought, a moment of thought. Mm. So, how do we try to be always positive, not to uh, let the negative thoughts overcome? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Mataji Dhanwat Pranams. So, the mind is very, very fickle and difficult to control. So the thoughts of the mind are going to come. And by the practice of Krishna consciousness, by good chanting, we will purify the mind. And we will, those bad thoughts will be purged, will be eliminated, erased from our mind. And the good thoughts of the beautiful lotus feet of the Supreme Lord and the wonderful activities of his associates will become manifest and prominent. But until that time, as that process is taking place of the mind being purified of all of these thoughts, Krishna gives us a very practical and exacting recipe to what to do. He says towards the end of the second chapter that he uses the analogy of the incessant flow of desires. They are like the rivers flowing into oceans. And what does he say to do? Just let them flow. Let the river flow, but the ocean remains undisturbed. Doesn't act on them. Doesn't move. So the flow of desires and ideas from the mind are going to come. Don't worry so much about them. But don't act on them. Don't perpetuate them. Let them flow, let them go, but don't act on them. And by remaining fixed in Krishna consciousness, don't worry, those thoughts will dissipate. Our mind is collecting desires, not just from this lifetime, from millions of lifetimes. So it'll take some time to cleanse our mind of all these desires, but just when they come up, when some bad thought comes, crazy thoughts, they're going to come. Often in the midst of your own bhakti, these crazy ideas will come. Just let them go. Don't pay any attention to them. No need to unnecessarily lament or become upset that why that thought came, oh, how I could think this. You know, some degree of wishing they were not there is okay, but don't overthink it also. Krishna says, let them flow. But don't become disturbed by them. Don't act on them. And in that way, we can be uh, protected. And no, you're in the process of Krishna consciousness. Every mantra you chant of the Maha Mantra, you are cleansing this mind. The mind is filthy. It has so many random and crazy and heinous thoughts. Okay. What's done is done. Now I'm focused on cleansing those. So while you're in the cleansing process, if they come up, just move on. Right? And don't, you know, desire to cleanse them. But don't, no need to, you know, try to figure out how you have to stop them. No, just let them flow. And that Krishna gives us this advice in, at the end of the second chapter. It's uh, verse 70, I believe, uh, where he speaks about the let the rivers of desires just flow into the ocean, but remain undisturbed. So that is what I can offer, my Prabhuji. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Um, and please pray for me that I stay positive in all situations and surrender to Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, wonderful answer, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Dhanva Pranams. Krishna Prabhuji, 
কোটি কোটি টাকা পড়া শিলা পর পাঁচ লাখ দিয়ে দিয়ে যাই সো মেনি কোশ্চেন আস্ক বাই দা ওয়াচটা ইট কভার কোশ্চেন অলসো थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर आंसर एंड सेनिक थैंक यू वेरी मच स्पेशली फॉर मेकिंग इन क्लास শিলা পর পাঁচ লাখ দিয়ে দিয়ে যাই টাকা পড়া হরে কৃষ্ণ মাতাজি নানা প্রণাম Thank you very much for your blessings. Okay, so if we have any other questions, otherwise we can conclude and prepare for wonderful celebrations taking place over the next many days tomorrow is the appearance day of advaita acharya the following sunday the appearance of lord nityananda so many wonderful appearance days are coming and going so we can relish the nectar of these great days <coughs>